Hi, I'm Charlotte Voisey. I'm the Global Head of Ambassadors with William Grant & Sons. Now, before joining William Grant & Sons as an ambassador back in 2006, I was a bartender. I'm from London and I used to bartend in London and I ran a bar called Apartment 195. I also worked for a period of time as a bartender in Spain and in Argentina. And my role now still allows me to travel all around the world Mainly what I do is education on cocktails and spirits in various different countries, attending the big trade shows around the world, and of course, working with our family of brand ambassadors in every country. We have a community of 100 brand ambassadors all around the world who work on our brands, such as Hendrix Gin, Glenfiddich, The Balvenie, and many more. So it's truly a wonderful job. I still get to do what I love, which is bartending and educating in our craft, the craft of the cocktail. And most recently, I'm delighted to have joined the European Bartender School Board of Education, specializing in gin, which really kind of brings me back home to London, where I'm from. Gin was really the first spirit I fell in love with, and I've always loved creating cocktails with gin. So this is a really fantastic opportunity for me. Today in the webinar, I'm excited to talk about just that. We're going to talk about gin, where it's come from, how it's traveled through history, some of the cocktails that have made gin famous, and I'll talk about some of the trends that we've seen in recent years that are still keeping bartenders passionate about the gin category all over the world. There's so much to explore and I'm super excited to share it all with you. In this first section of the webinar, we'll take a look at gin in general. Gin really began back in the 1600s and it came from something called Geneva, which was a Dutch spirit. A Dutch spirit always flavored with juniper. Now, back in the 1600s, back in the early days of most spirit categories, it was all about medicinal properties of the ingredients. Spirits were often administered for medicinal reasons. And juniper had medicinal properties. Juniper was quite easily available and juniper had a nice taste. So it seemed to be a natural choice for the Dutch at the time to flavor their spirits. Now, when there was a alliance between the Dutch and the English in the later 1600s, that's when Geneva came over to England at the time. And from Geneva, the English started to make their own adaptation of this juniper flavored spirit called Geneva, which was then called gin. The word gin really coming from Geneva, which in turn means juniper. So this story of juniper and gin is one that starts at the very beginning and one that remains very important today when we talk about gin. Gin and juniper are together, they're never separated, and even today's laws protects this by saying that gin's most dominant flavor must still be juniper. But that's not where the story ends because of course gin has many different flavors. Essentially gin is a neutral grain spirit base with the addition of botanicals. Now the most dominant botanical must be juniper berries as I've mentioned already, but thereafter gin distillers are open to choose any kind of botanical they wish. And the word botanical really is just a word for natural flavors that come from berries and herbs and spices and fruits and all kinds of things that can add aroma and flavor to gin. So with that being quite an open category of flavors, you can imagine that there are endless possibilities when it comes to the flavor of different gin brands. And we find that gin brands differ because of the very recipe of botanicals that the distiller chooses, juniper plus whatever they would like to make their gin from. But gin brands will also differ through the method of distillation that's chosen because the way that gin is made will also affect its flavor and its quality and how it's made in cocktails. So we have neutral grain spirit and we have botanicals. And to combine them, most gin distillers will use a method of distillation. Botanicals can be steeped in neutral grain spirit first for a few hours and then distilled with the resulting spirit now having this full rich imprint of the botanical flavor. That's one quite common way of distilling gin.
We can also pass botanicals into the spirit in its vapor form by using something called a botanical basket in a carter head still, which is a slightly more intricate way of combining botanicals and neutral grain spirit. This is another uh, less common way, but you'll find it in some gyms around the world. And there are different ways of combining the botanicals and neutral grain spirit depending on the type of gin that the distiller wishes to make, depending on the um, distillation equipment at their disposal. Um, so really it's about the recipe of botanicals and then the method chosen by which to introduce those botanicals to the neutral grain spirit that will determine the resulting style of gin. So if you think about it, there's just so many endless possibilities of the style and the flavor and quality of different gin brands out there, which is why we have so many these days. Because if you have a passion for distillation and access to the equipment and a little bit of creativity, we could, each of us, make our own gin uh, because there are many different possibilities out there. Now, over time, we have seen the evolution of gin styles. I've mentioned Geneva as kind of the originator, even though it's its own category now. When gin started to be made in England, we went through a style called Old Tom Gin, which was quite a rich, round, full-bodied gin that was often sweetened. And really, this was just an evolution of the style of gin that Geneva is or was in those days. After the old Tom Gin style, we move into what we call London Dry. Now, London Dry is a term that any gin connoisseurs and bartenders out there will know very well. It's a very prestigious category of gin, and it's a very, it's a legal classification of gin that still stands today. Now, London Dry would have been introduced in sort of the early 1800s, and it wasn't necessarily a style that was only made in London. In fact, London dry gin now can be made anywhere in the world, but the dry is the more important word because this is where we start to see gin drying out so it's less sweet like the old Tom and it's slightly drier. And this is where we start to see the style of gin that would become famous in cocktails like the Martini and would stand up to other wonderful ingredients like Campari and sweet vermouth in the Negroni and eventually would be highly versatile and mixed in all kinds of wonderful fancy drinks that we've learned through history and continue to riff on today. So London Dry is a very important part of the evolution of gin. Now after London Dry, gin started to be made all around the world and many different styles of gin came about. And as I've mentioned, in recent years, we've had an explosion in the gin category. I'm sure wherever you're watching from, you can name a local gin from your city or from your country, or even from the town where you live. Gin is literally made everywhere. And the wonderful thing about gin and the way that it's made is that it can be very localized because you can forage for local botanicals, uh, use ingredients that really reflect the local cuisine, culture, geography of wherever it is you're making your gin. So we have a bit of an evolution of the styles of gin through history to follow and to learn about. Um, and then everything kind of explodes and opens. And really gin is quite a global spirit, it's definitely home uh, to England and back then it was before Great Britain became a country. Um, but these days gin can be made any, everywhere. Uh, we have a couple of sort of geographical designations, there's a couple in Germany and obviously still in Holland with Geneva. But there's another one recently that I'll just touch on quickly because it's quite famous and that's Plymouth Gin. Now up until very recently, uh, this was protected as its own category and Plymouth Gin could only be made in the town of Plymouth in the south of England. And it was very easy to remember because there was one type of Plymouth Gin and it was called Plymouth Gin. Uh, now recently the uh, legal classification of Plymouth Gin has been retired uh, but to my knowledge there's still only one gin made in Plymouth. It's important to understand the brand and the history because it's mentioned many times in historical cocktail books. You see back then bartenders were also well aware of gin and they were well aware of the different styles of gin. So a cocktail recipe might call for Holland's gin or Geneva Dutch gin it was different to a recipe that would call for Old Tom Gin, something like an early Martinez, 
and then London Dry might be called for and Plymouth Gin often also occurs many times in recipes in historic cocktail books. So if you're a bartender researching your craft and learning about the history of bartending as we all do, you'll read old cocktail books and you'll see references to different types of gin um, and it's interesting to know why the bartenders at the time chose that and really it was because those gins will behave differently in cocktails. You see, everything I just mentioned about the endless combinations of botanicals giving us different flavors and distillation giving us different styles of gin, you can't always just switch out one gin for another in a cocktail recipe and expect the same results. But that's the beautiful part of working with gin because the gin itself, the flavor profile of the gin, can inspire us and can lead us to new versions of classic cocktails. Um, and that's something that I'm going to explore a little bit more in this webinar. In this next section of the webinar, I'm going to start demonstrating some cocktails and I've chosen to start with the martini, perhaps the most iconic, most important cocktail of them all. So classic, so simple, but so important to get right. Now the martini, the classic martini is a gin cocktail. These days it has evolved to be made with vodka in some instances, but the classic martini is a gin cocktail and that's what I'm going to show you today. Now there are many iterations of the martini, in fact if you research the history of the martini you'll find out that it itself was actually an iteration, uh, a twist on the Manhattan because whiskey was mixed with sweet vermouth for many years in the US and then when gin was available Somebody thought, let's try this with gin, and the original martinis would have been gin and sweet vermouth, Italian vermouth, because that was the vermouth at the hands of the American bartenders at the time, and they were the ones crafting all of our classic cocktails back in the late 1880s. The dry martini, as we've come to know it, refers to the inclusion of dry vermouth, a French vermouth, and it's the dry martini really that took hold and became the quintessential martini. The original recipe called for gin, dry vermouth and a couple of dashes of orange bitters. In some classic cocktail bars you'll still see that used. I'm going to show a slightly more modern version of the dry martini and omit the orange bitters and just keep it very, very classic. Um, again, if you're a martini drinker, there are many different ways that you can choose for your recipe to be executed. Those that enjoy martinis on a regular basis probably have their proportions well known and well loved. So somebody may well order a martini that's 10 to 1 or 5 to 1 or even 2 to 1, uh, referring to the proportion of gin to vermouth. And those that enjoy their martinis regularly are very passionate about these proportions. Um, I'm going to start with one that I like, which is a five to one. So five parts gin and one part vermouth. So let me show you how I make my martini. This is a stirred cocktail, the classic way. So I'm going to start with a mixing glass and I'm going to put my ice in first. Now some prefer to put the ingredients in first and then the ice. I think if you make your cocktail in a speedy fashion, it's okay to put the ice in first. And that way it can cool down your ingredients as you go. So five to one for me would be two and a half ounces of gin. So I've used two there and a half ounce and I'm using Hendrix gin today. And then one part of dry vermouth. I've got a nice Martini Rossi dry vermouth. Of course, Italy makes dry vermouth as well. Um, a half ounce, that's one part. Okay, now I'm gonna stir this up. So stirred cocktails, of course, are very classic. Typically, we would stir a cocktail when it's alcohol only, so spirit and vermouth, dash of bitters, something like an old fashioned would be stirred. There's no need for extra agitation that we would get from shaking. When I started bartending, I was always taught to stir 20 times counterclockwise and 20 times clockwise. So it's just a superstition that stuck with me. Although I totally lost count there. Oh. <laughs> just gonna top that with ice while I'm talking to make sure I keep everything cold because temperature in a martini is just so important. It's such a simple cocktail, therefore the details matter. So I'm going to serve this in a martini glass, just a classic martini glass, which 
I have kept chilled for this very purpose. Of course, it's really important to keep your glassware chilled if you're serving a cocktail up. And just carefully pour that, such a beautiful glass, such a simple cocktail. There we go, just about right. And to garnish my martini, I always like to use fresh lemon peel. We all know about the beautiful qualities of the essential oils in the citrus peel. And lemon peel is one of the most common botanicals used in gin, so it makes sense to garnish the martini with the lemon peel. And of course, it's all about that moment, right? When we spritz the essential oils from the lemon peel on top of the martini, we can drop that in because the lemon peel has an important place in the martini itself. And there we are, the gin martini, perfect harmony of gin and vermouth together. Probably the most classic cocktail of all time, uh, really has stood the test of time. And these days, it's a cocktail that every good bartender really must master, but also be open to the iterations that the guest might ask for, because the martini is also a very personal drink. Um, in this day and age, you'll see different interpretations on how to serve martinis all over the world. Bartenders are super creative. Um, but again, with such a classic cocktail, it's all about simplicity and mastering the details. So the gin martini. And that's the martini. Next up, we're gonna talk about another wonderful gin classic cocktail, and that's the Negroni. The Negroni came to us, discovered in the cafes of Florence in the 1920s, at a time where Italians and most Europeans would drink vermouth or bitters, things like Campari, on the rocks before dinner as part of their aperitif or aperitivo hour. Now, the, the Negroni is referred to as an aperitif, but watch out because the whole point of the Negroni is that somebody, Count Camilo, as the story goes, wanted an extra kick to his Americano. Americano would be Campari, sweet vermouth on the rocks, lengthened with soda. He thought, well, actually, I want something a bit stronger, so skip the soda and give me a shot of gin, and now we're talking. So that's what the Negroni kind of came to be. Uh, so a little bit stronger than your classic aperitif, but beautiful as a pre-dinner cocktail nonetheless. Nice and dry and just drawing out of those wonderful herbaceous botanical notes of the gin that once again marries so well with vermouth, this time sweet vermouth, and with Campari. So a wonderful drink, match made in heaven in terms of ingredients, and it's one of those equal part cocktails, which as bartenders we come to love because it's easy to remember the ingredients and there's a little bit of wiggle room there if we make any mistakes. So the classic Negroni then would be equal parts gin, sweet vermouth and Campari, also ingredients that pretty much any bar on the planet has, so no matter where you are in the world, you can always get a Negroni. It's also relatively easy to make. It can be sort of thrown together in a glass with a nice twist of orange and you've got a decent Negroni. Um, but much like with any cocktail, if we study the craft of what we're doing a little bit more, we can make a better balanced cocktail. Much like the martini and other classic cocktails, there are many iterations and riffs and variations on the Negroni. We can take away the equal part proportions and play around to make something that's a little heavier on the gin, perhaps. We've even seen bartenders switch out the base spirit and not use gin, but use something, use a, a whiskey or even tequila these days. Um, any spirit can find its, its home in a Negroni. But I'm gonna do a twist on the classic Negroni. Um, so I'm gonna stir this cocktail, but I'm also gonna serve it on the rocks. Now, the first time I ever came across a Negroni was probably about 15 or so years ago, and I was always served a Negroni up. That was just how I first encountered the cocktail. These days, most bartenders serve a Negroni on the rocks. Um, so anyhow, I'm gonna stir my Negroni and then strain it over fresh ice in the end, and I'll tell you why as we get there. So mixing glass for a stirred cocktail, and I'm gonna fill this with ice. And then sticking with equal parts for this recipe. This is the, what I call the unusual Negroni, and it's made really to showcase Hendrix gin as best we can. So one ounce of Hendrix. And then instead of Campari, I'm actually gonna choose to use Aperol. So Aperol is a much loved cocktail ingredient, a little softer than Campari. So 
allows the Hendrix through a little more. One ounce of Aperol. And then my third ingredient, rather than using a classic sweet vermouth, I'm gonna use Lille Rosé. So this would be closer to a Blanc or a Bianco vermouth. So still quite sweet. So we've got the right proportion of flavor profiles but not as heavy as a traditional Italian sweet vermouth. So again, just playing to the gin that I've chosen and allowing that to shine the through. So just fill up a little more ice. And I'll give this a good stir. And stir in a cocktail really for three main reasons. One, to cool the ingredients. Two, to mix them together. And lastly, to get some dilution from the ice, just to take the edge off. That's why we stir a cocktail. And as I mentioned, I'm gonna strain this over fresh ice in a rocks glass or an old fashioned glass. So again, kept chilled until I need the glass so everything's nice and cold. I'm gonna fill this with fresh ice. So another sort of saying I learned early on as a bartender is we never use ice twice, right? So the ice in the glass here or ice that we shake with is now obsolete. It's had its job. Uh, it's cooled down our cocktail, but it's no longer useful enough to keep the temperature of your cocktail in the glass. So that's why we always use fresh ice in the glass that we're serving. And now for a garnish here, it's nice to use a big slice of orange just like they would have in the cafes of Florence but it's also nice to take a little twist of orange here and just spritz and discard the peel just so you've got that extra burst of brightness and orange and that's the unusual Negroni twist on the classic um, many iterations out there so it's a wonderful cocktail to learn and then explore your own version of And moving on from the Negroni, the next cocktail I'm going to make for this webinar is a twist on the French 75. Now I get asked all the time, what's your favorite cocktail? What do you drink when you go out? And if I had to choose a gin cocktail that I probably love the most, it would be the French 75. And this is a cocktail that came to us in the 1920s-ish. Um, originally made with cognac, but quickly became a gin cocktail because gin cocktails were more in vogue in that era, especially in the US where cocktail culture was strongest. So the French 75 is just this wonderful, quite indulgent concoction. Uh, gin typically as the base, certainly for me and certainly for today. Uh, some fresh lemon juice, a little bit of sugar, and then topped with champagne. I mean, what's not to love? But if you think about the cocktail ingredients I've just mentioned, it's quite a simple drink, really. Gin, fresh lemon, and some sweetener is really just a sour, right? Spirit citrus and sugar is a sour. So much like with the sour category, this is a really great cocktail to do your own riffs on. You could do seasonal twists by switching out some of the ingredients. Uh, the most obvious way, uh, place to play is with the simple syrup. So rather than just using straight sugar, here you can inject a flavor and that's what I've done for this one today. Um, also topped with champagne, you could of course, if you topped this with soda, you'd find yourself drinking a Tom Collins. So it's very much, again, one of those cocktails that fits into the evolution of cocktail recipes and there's many ways we can twist it up. Um, also by choosing the gin that you're going to use may inspire the other ingredients that you choose. You might want to do something that's more floral inspired and choose a, perhaps a rosé sparkling wine that has high florals. Um, you might choose a more juniper forward London dry style gin and keep everything quite dry. Uh, you could even make this cocktail with Geneva and Old Tom and, and make it a little fuller and richer. But today I'm going to show you my French 75 with blackberry and mint and, and starting with Hendrix gin. So to make the French 75, this is essentially a shaken cocktail. First we shake the ingredients, then we'll strain them out and then we'll top with champagne at the end. We would never shake cocktails with a carbonated beverage inside the cocktail shaker. And if you don't know why not, try it at home and then let me know how you did. Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna pour my uh, first cocktail ingredients into the shaker. So we'll start with one ounce and a half of Hendrix gin. So I'll just measure that out and pour that straight in. Then I'm gonna use a half ounce of fresh lemon juice. So this is freshly squeezed lemon juice. As we know, fresh citrus always tastes much better in cocktails. 
And then a half ounce of, this is a blackberry and mint simple syrup. So I made a regular simple syrup, um, used the juice of some blackberries, and then also infused some loose mint leaves to give a really vibrant, quite strong flavored syrup that just a half ounce will give a lovely injection of flavor and color to this cocktail, which is lovely. So those ingredients go in first. Now we're gonna shake it up. We always wanna make sure we put a lot of ice in the cocktail shaker, really as much as you can, um, so that we can give this a good shake. You can also make this drink on the fly by muddling blackberries and mint together and add in a bit of regular simple syrup if this tickles your fancy but you haven't done the prep yet. Okay, so I'm gonna strain this first part into a flute. Again, keeping glassware chilled where possible and even if you don't have a fridge or a freezer by close proximity to your bar, you could simply fill your glassware with ice and a little bit of soda water and then just dump that out when you're ready to use it. So. I'm gonna strain the first part of this cocktail carefully, double strain into my flute. And this just keeps any little pips of the blackberries or specks of mint out of my drink, like so. You can see that color all comes from the blackberries. And now we're gonna to top with champagne. So here we go. Now this is one of those questions also, is it okay to use sparkling wine? Does it need to be champagne? I would say if it's a special occasion, it should always be champagne. But of course, if you've got a lovely taste in sparkling wine from elsewhere in the world, then it's fine to use that too. Love that sound. And now we carefully pour the champagne into the cocktail. Anytime you've got sort of fresh fruit in a champagne cocktail, it's likely to react quite lively. So, just go easy there. So just a little bit of patience and top that up. There we go. And I'm just gonna give this a little stir. Anytime we top with a carbonated beverage again, just a gentle stir to integrate the ingredients. So that first sip has a little bit of everything. Okay, and for the garnish here, we can do many different things. For I'm gonna choose a contrast of color and a little reminder of the gin that we've used, Hendrix. I've chosen a slice of cucumber there. So there we have uh, my iteration of a French 75, this one with blackberry and mint. Delicious, beautiful color, very festive. So we're done with the French 75 for now. I'll put that to one side. And in this final section of the webinar, we're gonna do a bit of a Q and A. We put a call out for questions to our EBS audience. And the first one to address is how to become a gin expert and why. I've been lucky enough to become a gin expert because of my career really with William Grant and & Sons and my time as a bartender. So William Grant & Sons make Hendrix Gin. Um, so for 15 years now, I've had access to our distillery in Scotland, to our master distiller, Leslie Gracie, who's just fabulous. And really I've been able to get up close and look at the botanicals that we use, touch them, smell them, understand where they come from, look at the stills, see how they work and really understand the full production process of how Hendrix is made so that I can talk about it and I can talk about it in different ways to different people. But importantly, just as importantly, I've also been able to visit other gin distilleries because I think if you want to become an expert and have command over any topic, you really need to understand as broadly as possible the full landscape. So it's not enough for me just to know about Hendrix. I need to understand how Hendrix fits in with the gin category and where its place is in history of gin and the evolution of cocktails. So I would recommend that if you wanted to become a gin expert or increase your understanding of gin, any opportunity you get to visit a gin distillery, grab that opportunity, ask questions to a master distiller, uh, read up, there's lots of education now available, especially online. Um, I've also had the opportunity myself to work with other ambassadors before me who have taught me a great deal, so I've been very lucky there. Um, but like anything, the more information you can absorb and then by 
um, retelling that information on by teaching others and talking about gin with other people really helps to sort of cement your understanding. But gin, like many things, is constantly evolving, so I have to keep on my toes to keep up with the latest gin brands, perhaps new innovations in distillation, new thought in botanicals, and of course, new creations when it comes to gin cocktails. So it's an ever-evolving topic that I'm always keeping on top of. But most of all, I'm passionate about gin. You need to be passionate to fuel your energy to uh, keep the research up and, and keep learning more about anything. The next question that we have is about how would I introduce someone to gin who's not really yet passionate about gin? And I used to do this a lot as a bartender and as a brand ambassador, and it's all about understanding what that person likes. So with gin, we have the fortune that gin is always mixed, right? If you think about it, it's truly the only spirit that we would never drink by itself unless we're tasting for educational purposes. But gin is always mixed with something. So if you approach the mission or the challenge as how do I find the right cocktail for that person who doesn't yet feel passionate about gin, that's where I think you can get results. And that's certainly how I used to operate as a bartender. So it may be that a guest comes in and they drink Cosmo or whiskey sours or they like champagne or they prefer a lighter bodied red wine try to find out what type of flavor and drinking experience they do enjoy and chances are from your knowledge of gin cocktails classic cocktail recipes you can pick out something that can closely match their description so if you're a bartender trying to open the doors to gin for one of your guests find out what they like and try and match that to something. And if you are a guest or, or somebody that uh, dr likes to drink cocktails but hasn't quite gotten into gin yet, start with the cocktails that you like and try asking for them with gin. Um, you'll be surprised at how many sort of vodka cocktails out there when made with gin actually taste really good and you start to get some little nuances of botanicals shine through. It can be really satisfying and from there you start to identify the type of gin that you like, the type of gin cocktails you like and the world is your oyster. And our final question today is, is Hendrix gin a London dry gin? which is a very good question. So the answer, the short answer is no, it's not. But let me explain to you why. So a London dry gin is a legal classification of gin, which has everything to do with the method of production. Now, Hendrix Gin is quite famous for its addition of cucumber and rose, as well as 11 other botanicals that are used to make Hendrix Gin. Now, cucumber and rose petals are two very delicate ingredients. The essential oil content in both is so low that actually you can't distill cucumbers and roses. Uh, we tried and it doesn't work. So without distillation, uh, these ingredients are added to Hendrix after distillation. And that, that very fact there protects the integrity of the ingredients so that we get the beautiful aroma and flavor of cucumber and rose. But it also means that Hendrix gin is not a London dry gin because London dry gin can only use botanicals during distillation. No botanicals can be used after distillation. So that categorically means that Hendrix gin is not a London dry gin. It's a very unusual type of gin that kind of sits by itself in its own little category. Uh, but it's a nice way to explain the difference between different styles of gin, especially these days as the gin category continues to evolve um, more and more with many gins from all over the world. So I hope that answers the question. I hope you've enjoyed the webinar today. Thank you so much for watching. It's always a pleasure for me to talk about gin and gin cocktails. Thanks so much.